Chapter 11 In the history of paganism, parents often slew their children upon the altars of their gods to appease their wrath or obtain their favors. But we now see a stranger thing. It is Christian parents forcing their children into the temples and to the very feet of the idols of Rome, under the fallacious notion of having them educated. While the pagan parent destroyed only the temporal life of his child, the Christian parent, for the most part, destroys his eternal life. The pagan was consistent. He believed in the almighty power and holiness of his gods. He sincerely thought that they ruled the world, and that they blessed both the victims and those who offered them. But where is the consistency of the Protestant who sacrifices his child on the altars of the Pope? Does he believe in his holiness or in his supreme and infallible power? Then why does he not go and throw himself at his feet? The Protestants say as an excuse that the superiors of colleges and convents have assured them that their religious convictions would be respected and that nothing should be said or done to take away or even shake the religion of their children. Our first parents were no more cruelly deceived by the seductive words of the serpent than the Protestants are by the deceitful promises of the priests and nuns of Rome. I myself witnessed this promise given by our superior to a father who was a judge in New York. Then a few days later, that same superior said to me, You know some English, and this young man knows French enough to understand each other. Try to become his friend and bring him over to our holy religion. His father is a most influential man in the United States, and his only son is the heir of an immense fortune. Great results for the future of the church in the U.S. might follow his conversion. I replied, Have you forgotten the promise you have made to his father never to say or do anything to shake or take away the religion of that young man? My superior smiled at my simplicity and said, When you shall have studied theology, you will know that Protestantism is not a religion, but that it is a negation of religion. Protesting cannot be the basis of any doctrine. Thus, when I promised Judge Pike that the religious convictions of his child should be respected, and that I should not do anything to change his faith. I promised the easiest thing in the world, since I promised not to meddle with a thing which has no existence. Blinded by the reasoning of my superior, I set myself to work to make a good Roman Catholic of that young friend. I would probably have succeeded had not a serious illness forced him to return home. Protestants who read this may be indignant against such deceit, but your contempt should be upon your own selves. The superior, Mr. Leprahan, was honest. He acted upon principle which he thought good and legitimate and would cheerfully have given his last drop of blood for them. The priest of Rome is not the traitor here. It is the Protestant who wishes to have his children educated by a Jesuit who is a man of no religion. Nothing is more ridiculous than to hear such a man begging respect for his religious principles. It is not the priest of Rome who was the contemptible, dishonest, and a traitor to his principles. But it was the Protestant who was false to his gospel and to his own conscience by having his child educated by the servants of the Pope. When I was in the Church of Rome, we often spoke of the necessity of making superhuman efforts to attract young Protestants into our colleges and nunneries. As the shortest and only means of ruling the world before long, the priests of Rome themselves boast that more than half of the pupils of the nuns are the children of Protestants, and that seven-tenths of those Protestant children sooner or later become the firmest disciples and the true pillars of popery in the United States. But, say many Protestants, where can we get safer securities that the morals of our girls will be sheltered than in those convents? The faces of those good nuns, their angelic smiles, even from their lips, from which seems to flow a perfume from heaven, are not these the unfailing signs that nothing will taint the hearts of our dear children when they are under the care of those holy nuns? Angelic smiles, lips from which flow perfume from heaven, expressions of peace and holiness of the good nuns, delusive allurements, cruel deceptions, mockery of comedy. Yes, all these angelic smiles, all these expressions of joy and happiness are but allurements to deceive honest but too trusting men. For a long time I believed that there was something true in all the display of peace and happiness which I saw in the faces of a good number of nuns. But how soon my delusions passed away when I read with my own eyes in a book of the secret rules of the convent that one of their rules is always, especially in the presence of strangers, 
to have an appearance of joy and happiness, even when the soul is overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. The motives given for thus wearing a continual mask is to secure the esteem and respect of the people, and to win more securely the young ladies to the convent. The poor nun's heart is often full of sorrow, and her soul is drowned in a sea of desolation. But she is obliged under oath always to appear joyful. Ah, if the Protestants could know, as I do, how much the hearts of those nuns bleed, how much those poor victims of the Pope feel themselves wounded to death, how almost every one of them die at an early age, broken-hearted, they would weep at their profound misery. Instead of helping Satan to maintain those sad dungeons by giving their gold and their children, they would let them crumble into dust and thus check the torrents of silent, bitter tears which those cells hide. But, says one, the education is so cheap in the nunnery. I answer, if it were half the price, it would still cost twice more than it is worth. Cheap things are always too highly paid for. Intellectually, the education in the nunnery is completely null. The great object of the Pope and the nuns is to captivate and destroy the intelligence. And what kind of moral education can a young girl receive from a nun who believes that she can live as she pleases, that nothing evil can come of her, neither in this life nor in the next, if only she is devout to the Virgin Mary? Let Protestants read The Glories of Mary by St. Liguri, a book found in the hands of every nun and priest, and they will understand what kind of morality is practiced and taught inside the walls of the Church of Rome.